Yeah. Thank you, Hazel. If you'll be turning, please, to Romans 6. I'll just take a moment and remind you, if I can, uh, that Paul has begin, been uh, a discussion, if you will, uh, albeit a, a one-sided debate, uh, about the Jewish law to obtain salvation uh, versus the acceptance of Jesus as Savior by faith. Uh, to receive the true righteousness of God's salvation. So what I'm saying is that the Jewish law was the, was the thing that, that Paul was speaking against, if you will, because that's what they'd had for centuries. So now he's trying to help them to understand that God is in Jesus, the Messiah, so that they could, by their faith, believe in Jesus, as we talked about last week, to receive the true righteousness of God's salvation. And really, the, the first verse of, of Romans, he's been talking about this. So he, he's trying to reach out to not only the Jewish Christians in Rome, but he's trying to reach out to all the Jews and, and all the Gentiles as well. So to the Gentiles, Paul is trying to understand that uh, their previous life, he wants them to understand that their previous life brought bondage to sin. And frankly, condemnation to hell then, right? And to the Jews, that they would understand that the law is not void to be not obeyed anymore, but that the law has no significance for obtaining the righteousness of God for salvation. Without Jesus, they are as lost as the Gentiles are. And frankly, Paul is pleading quite desperately here. And, and either... <laughs> Either he's not believing that they're thinking about this and understanding it, or he's speaking to a people that have been so impacted by what they've heard for centuries, for centuries that Paul's words seem like nonsense to them. Probably both, right? Probably both. He did not want his people to go to hell. And they, for centuries, have heard something that's now no longer the truth. So Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And he hopes to uh, reach, but he knows that the Jews from Jerusalem, and, and if you'll think about it, we studied this in, in, on a Wednesday night. All along his missionary journeys, Paul was troubled with extreme trouble from um, Orthodox Jews that were fighting against him. As a matter of fact, Jews from Jerusalem would follow him, and then the Berean, uh, the 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 Thessalonica and the Berean and so forth. Wherever he went, there was those Jews who would, who would go after him and even try to kill him to stop him from telling the truth about Jesus Christ. To them, it was so nonsensical, it was, it was actually uh, something worth killing him for. That's what he dealt with all the time. God sent his Messiah, didn't he? Even today, there is only a mere percentage of Jews that recognize and believe in Jesus. And when you and when you see, now listen to this, when you see a great turnaround in the Jews believing about Jesus, the Messiah, they get ready one day. It's not going to be long until we're out of here. So Paul begins to use language here in our passage today that it, by today's standards is offensive. He's talking about slavery. But in fact, slavery was a known way of life in Rome. <clears throat> Frankly, probably the most of the whole world, uh, the known world, I should say, for, for centuries. Especially in battle. When, when uh, a country would win in battle, they would take slavery. Even the, even the Hebrews did that uh, as they went through uh, their 40 years towards the end. So, uh, especially in, in places like uh, uh, Gaul and Eastern Africa and even Britain, the percentage of slaves to Roman citizens was like 60 to 70 percent. Even in, even in, in Rome, slave, there was about 30 percent of the population were slaves. So Paul is using here uh, 
a comparison that makes sense to those that he is trying to convince. Okay? So it made sense to them. That's what they lived in. That was their, that was their, their mentality. So as a final reminder of what we've been studying about since we skipped some verses last week, Paul is continuing an argument that he started in verse 1 about whether or not a Christian is allowed to sin. So join me in verse 12, and we'll pick up a little of that, of that argument, and we're going to continue from verse 12 to verse 19. And look on, and Kathy's going to help you with, uh, if you don't have your Bible. Beginning verse 12. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you became obedient from the heart that, that form of teaching, or to that form of teaching that which you were committed, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh, but just as you have presented your members as slaves to impurity, and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness. So now, present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Wow. So for us today, this is not a hard argument to understand. This, quite frankly, is just meat and potatoes, Sunday School 101, uh, about whether or not we should continue to dabble in sin or not. And the easy answer is what? No. no. But Paul says, God forbid, or certainly not. Those are the interpretations. But the Romans, the Corinthians, the Gauls, and, and others who have been heavily involved in, in sin in their culture and fortification... To the point that in Corinth, you were worshiping the gods in Corinth by being involved in, in, uh, in fortification with a female or a male <coughs> prostitute in the temple. That's how they worshiped. They were so far into that culture. <coughs> the Romans, as you know, developed a lifestyle of debauchery as well. That during their long reign, adultery and even murder were not uncommon events. Eventually, orgies and drunkenness became acceptable behavior. <clears throat> but Paul's arguments are really just classic arguments. Verse 12 says that you have to dethrone sin from your life. I like that. Do you remember the four spiritual laws? Now, I'm going to read these here, and uh, Kathy's going to help us uh, with this, and I want you to see the correlation and the, and the parallels that Paul is, is sharing with us here uh, in, in this. So let me, let me look here. Uh, four spiritual laws, number one. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Remember these are these little uh, school bus yellow pamphlets that we, that we had? Uh, law two is man is sinful and separated from God. Therefore, he cannot know and experience God's love and plan for his life. That's a, that is a normal person. Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. Through him you can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. Law 4 is we must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Then we can know and experience God's love and plan for our lives. So can I show that, that law number 1, that, that first one here? This is, this is the Christ-centered life. When we're living a Christ-centered life, Christ is on the throne of our life. We are, we're saying the right things. We're doing the right things. We're, even though we sin, we ask God to forgive us. 
and, and, and basically we try to live in peace with one another and we try to do things that are good. That is the Christ-centered life. When Christ is sitting on the throne of our lives. But let's look at the next one. So Christ-centered life versus self-directed life. What happens there? Well, Christ is dethroned. Sin is sitting on, self is sitting on the throne. So if self is sitting on the throne, guess what? Sin is sitting on the throne. Because man's natural state is a, is, is a state, a nature of sin. I don't care who you are. You can, you can claim we're on our own and you're responsible. I'm just telling you, we have a nature of sin that we inherited from Adam. That's the truth. So, so our interests are what? About ourselves. When we, when we were going to uh, your wake the, for your grandmother, Dwight, and when we went to the funeral yesterday, I, I bet between those two events, I bet we saw six or seven cars run, run red lights, didn't we? And we certainly saw some fast cars going down uh, Walton Walker yesterday in Wanda, about 80, 90 miles an hour. Self is on the throne. And therefore, sin is on the throne. So Paul is telling us here in, in that if you, you want a life that is, that is righteous to God, then the only thing that the law will do is to keep you out of trouble. Guess what? For as long as you can obey the law, which won't be long. <laughs> and the law cannot save you even when you do try to obey it. But guess what? God sent us his son. Because anyone who just obeys the law is condemned to hell with everyone else who rejects Jesus Christ. Here's the point. Is that, <clears throat> Kathy, is that either you are going to be obedient unto God and the scriptures by yielding yourself to God and accepting Jesus and God's righteousness, or else you are going to continue in the way of bondage. And its ultimate conclusion is physical death and spiritual death. That's the only conclusion that sin is going to bring. <clears throat> Let me reread verse 16. Look at verse 16 with me. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves... For obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in <coughs> righteousness. So I want to be clear here that what we spend our time doing, listen to me, don't, don't think about your roast right now. What we spend time doing and what we spend time listening to is, well, let me just go ahead and say this. And those people who we hang out with, that's who we're going to be. Who we hang out with, who we listen to, who we spend our time with, or what we spend our time doing is what we're going to be. I used to tell people, you are what your friends are. Yeah, mostly guys would be the ones who would argue with me about that. No, I can do it by myself. I'm strong enough. <laughs> so I'd say, you know, what else can I say? Okay. Go do your thing. Do it your way. But guess what would happen? Virtually every time they were back in front of me within weeks or months, and they were in serious trouble. Okay, Mr. Pippen, you were right. <laughs> I told him the same thing I tell my wife. I told you I was right all along. I used to go by Sue Ann and pick up a teenager in Grand Prairie and bring him to church with us and, and speak into his life and encourage him. And then one day he walks out and says, I don't want to go to church anymore. And so I call him, no, I don't want to go to church today. I don't want to go to church today. So, you know, eventually I stopped going by. Then one day he shows up in front of me professionally. So he gets placed 
on a probation and I speak into his life and I warned him and I tried to get his attention and it wasn't but five months. He took off to 10 2 and was gone for months. And the next time I saw him, he had a burglary of a habitation charge. You are what your friends are. And what you and you are what you put in your mind. And you are what you think about. And you speak what you're used to hearing. I don't like it, but I know this is true. Sin is hard to let go of and remove from your thinking because there is some pleasure in that life. I used to have 60 plus and 70 plus year old people, 70 plus year old people. Continue to use methamphetamine and cocaine. Why? Why in the world would they do that? Why would they risk spending years in prison if they've been caught with those drugs? Only to come out five to ten years later and their grandchildren were all grown up and they missed their life. Why would they do that? Because there is some pleasure in their sin. And whatever and or whoever they are hanging out with and listening to gave them the motivation and the impetus to do a crime and risk their future rather than change their behavior and comply with what is right. But here's the outcome. Look on the screen. Sin brings weakness. Sin brings impurity. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, and it will keep you longer than you want to stay in the wallow of the sewer that it puts you in. Because the flesh is weak. But if you will surround yourself with the good things of life, and as Dwight mentioned multiple times yesterday, buddy, if you will embrace the fruits of the Spirit, then you will be bound to the things of God. That's why I ask you to read and hopefully study some in your Bible every day. So that you will strengthen your mind and spirit because the world, which is Satan's world, wants to taint you and bring blight into your life instead of the good things of God. And you know what? We've got to keep, keep taking that dose of medicine over and over to, to push the things of the world out of our heart and mind. Because that, that gets played over and over and over. <clears throat> so Paul has been talking about in these last passages that we're studying today. That if we present our body and mind and think into the ways of Satan, then guess what? We're going to be bound to the lawlessness of Satan and the evil words and thoughts that such lawlessness will produce in our lives. Now listen, I'm almost done. Wake up, Mira. <laughs> but if you will pursue the things of God and you follow His holy word, then we will embrace the future and the righteousness of God through our daily sanctification. We will embrace the future and the righteousness of God through our daily sanctification of what we do for Christ. For in Christ we have hope. In his embrace, we are shielded in love for his glory and our good. Amen. 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 Pray with me. Lord, we love you. Uh, we, are, we are stunned that you take care of us and bless us, and that you watch over us and, take, and, and do the things you do in our lives. We are stunned. Even though we go through troubles, even though we are praying for the Gladys Harris family because they have lost a loved one and, and, and some friends that I have that I pray for that have lost loved ones. Those are deep valleys. Those are valleys that are very, that are hurtful. Maybe we have a, a child that's going through some kind of divorce. Maybe we have a child that's going through a serious illness. Maybe we're going through a serious illness and we just wonder what happened, God? Where did, where did you go? And all of a sudden, one day, we wake up and realize it, you were even closer to us 
during those difficult times. So for those who have awakened this morning without their loved one, we pray for universally. For those who have awakened this morning with an illness, we pray for them. For those in this sanctuary today that have a struggle or an illness or a trouble that we want to bring to you in Jesus' name, I pray that you will look upon the hearts and minds of those in this sanctuary today and that you allow me to pray for them right now in Jesus' name. Resolve their concern, heal their bodies, restore them to your place that you want them to be. And I thank you, God, for hearing me. Guide us in the things that we do. Thank you for, this, for, this, for the precious prayer that Hazel prayed over our Christmas boxes as they go to lands where people are, are less fortunate. And I pray for the business meeting that we're about to have in just a moment. Guide our hearts and minds to be in, in tune with you, Holy Spirit. All of this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.